We're starting a new topic. And so, introduced you to the scientific method, right? And we got goal, model, data evaluation, um, revision. For most of the semester, we're going to be going through models, data, and evaluation. That's the focus of most of the course. So today we're going to start models, and it's going to be a general kind of high-level lecture concepts. There are going to be some examples, but then for the next week or so, I'm going to be going through sort of specific illustrations of these, how they apply to different things, and they'll be very much outside the context of traditional science. <clears throat> So, models, and I'll give you a very loose definition. A model is anything, can be an idea, object, plan, picture, organism, we use to represent something else. And of course we have to tie it to the goal, so we'll say here, in achieving a goal. <clears throat> and a point we'll come back to many times is the is that the model is judged by the goal. So now I'm going to go through a bunch of examples. It's kind of like show and tell, actually, for most of the lecture. You won't need to take too many notes down, but what I'm trying to do is convey to you the breadth with which we use these things. Everything we do every day involves models at the level we're talking about in this class. So I'm applying the broadest possible definition to it. You might think, oh, models are mathematics, okay? Much broader than that. So I'm going to start with, even though I promised you, <clears throat> you can think of it as a campaign promise on the first day, um, there would be no biology. There will, I'll talk about different model organisms for understanding genetics. And so the first two on the list are going to be the type of virus and um, bacteria. <coughs> And I don't know whether one, it will help to, uh, I guess you can kind of see that with the lights on. So this is a Petri dish, and you see a bunch of blobs on it, and these blobs are colonies of bacteria. And each colony, the way this works is you spread a certain number of bacteria on the plate, you let this thing grow overnight, maybe you let it grow 24 hours, depends on the bacteria. And they grow up into these colonies. Each colony has probably 10 million bacteria in it. They just not happen to be a harmful bacteria. So, um, <clears throat> and so you can only see 50 colonies or so on it. This is a plate with more colonies, probably the same bacteria, um, and you get the idea. So we either put down more bacteria on this plate because we've got I don't know probably about. 400 colonies on this one. We've only got 40 or 50 here. But <clears throat> you can handle huge numbers of bacteria in a small space inexpensively. And this is very useful for understanding genetics because you could, you know, it, it could be that we only put down 40 or 50 bacteria on this plate. Could be we put down um, the equivalent of the world's population of people in bacteria on the plate but that there was some kind of drug on here that kept the bacteria from growing, and so we're only counting the survivors. But bacteria prove very useful in biology, as you already know. <clears throat> this is a 
on this plate it's a type of virus that we don't have to worry about, but um, <clears throat> try and give a dark background here for some of this. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. So, <clears throat> in this case, the plate is kind of hazy except in a few spots where you can see these clear areas. And what we did in this case was we put down probably, I don't know, a million, 10 million bacteria on the surface of the plate, but in addition, mixed in there, perhaps at spots where you put them down, we put down viruses that actually um, chew up the bacteria. And as a consequence, you end up with these areas that are kind of clear that you can see through. That's where the virus has sort of multiplied itself, and there are probably, you know, 10 to 100 million viruses in each one of these spots, and it simply grew out eating more and more bacteria up to a point that the plate stopped. Again, the advantage is to get one of these holes grown takes a couple hours, and in that hole you've got, you know, you've gone from one, <clears throat> one bacterial virus up to potentially uh, 10 or 100 million of them. So very fast growth, you can handle very large numbers in a very small space. <clears throat> you probably all know that, you know, you've ex been exposed to this, but <clears throat> just to give you an idea of the range of model organisms and how useful they've been in biology, and we can even say useful for understanding human genetics, Bacterial viruses <clears throat> have provided the foundations of molecular genetics. And anyone know one other? Well, I, no, I don't want to emphasize biology. Um, DNA is a genetic material. We were able to, you know, we probably would have figured it out in humans eventually, but it figured it out a lot quicker um, in viruses. And it didn't have to be the case that what works for viruses works for people. In fact, there are some types of viruses that DNA is not the genetic material. Um, <clears throat> but it so happened that it is for a lot of them, and that discovery then led us on to other discoveries ultimately about humans. Bacteria I showed you. These have been good for understanding the relationship of genes to physiology. Yeast. Why are yeast our friends? Yes, in particular beer and I guess some wines, right? Well, yeast, that, but also bread, other things. <clears throat> but in biology, <clears throat> they gave us control of cell division, which turns out to be the same genes, the same, roughly the same genes that control cell division in yeast control cell division in us and it's escape from these controls on cell division that lead to cancer. So that's why we care about this. Um, also some very early work in yeast gave us a relationship of genes to proteins. Flies. These are little fruit flies, the kind that when you let the bananas get a little too ripe, suddenly you see things flying around them in your kitchen. Um, gave us that x-rays and ra other forms of radiation cause genetic damage. And I'll put an arrow on the notes, meaning pointing out the door and up the hill, because that discovery was made in the next building up the hill by a guy named Herman Muller, who eventually, this was done in the 1920s, um, eventually won a Nobel Prize for that. <clears throat> Worms gave us an understanding of programmed cell death. 
which is really important to why we don't get cancer. It's important to development. It's re really fundamental. Um, and then some little fish called zebrafish gave rise to developmental genetics, or at least big understandings. Right, so here are a bunch of things that if you walked outside, one you might not, might not be able to see because they're too tiny. In other cases, you'd swat them or step on them and so on, um, <clears throat> that have led to big understanding, changes in our understanding of, human, of, of genetics as it applies to us. These are model organisms, um, and they're very useful. Even though they're not us, they have helped us understand us. So I figure you kind of get that point. Models outside science is where <clears throat> we use them ubiquitously, but um, you might not make the relationship between their use in science and how you're using them. I'll start with something that, again, you probably all understand. Scale models, they can be big versions of something small or small versions of something big. I'll just use this here. I suppose I should start <coughs> getting a more realistic, uh, well, this is fine, but something more modern like a transformer structure. <clears throat> you know what transformers are? They still exist? These things that'll, you know, I guess there was one in the movie Spaceballs that, um, <clears throat> I forget, it was like a spaceship that turned into a giant maid that sucked all the air off the planet. So. Scale model, here's the sun, <coughs> and uh, you're going to have to vote here. Here are possible Earths, and what we're going to do is ask about what you think is the right scale model Earth, given that this is the size of the sun. And at this point, things start getting... <laughs> I'm tempted to use some phrases that I probably don't want on tape, so a <laughs> little piece of... <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> the sun. How many are going to vote for this as the relative size of the earth? This. This, 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 this. Hmm, maybe more than last hour. It's this one. We are, our diameter is about. <laughs> I don't even know where it went. Well. Forget. <clears throat> okay, so um, anyway, there is one other somewhere in there. It's on the what? Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we know who needs glasses. Okay, so pretend this one's still here. Um, so now that's relative size of the Earth. What about the distance from the Sun? So how many think, in terms of the orbit, where we are in this orbit, how many think that we're within the span of this podium, consider it including the tables? How many think we're outside that door? How many think we're in the room somewhere outside the podium? Um, you know, like it doesn't hurt to vote even if it's, where's the guy that, that said the sun orbits the earth or something like that, you know. 
vote even if it's ridiculous. Uh, anyway, the, it's probably our orbit is about halfway from the podium to the door. So these are things we can sort of figure out. We can develop a model, and then if you were to use it in classroom, especially like grade school or whatever, you know, the students would be pretty impressed that that you know this this thing, which is a very manageable size, you know, is <clears throat> really makes us seem tiny because we got this little number 12 BB that's floating around, you know, in an orbit that's about halfway out across the classroom. But so <clears throat> we're going to come back to limitations of this, but you get the point. Scale models can be useful for certain types of things. <clears throat> so we did that. <clears throat> so I would not ask you which of the objects was the, you know, the scale model of the Earth. I would reference the fact that we did show a scale model, perhaps, of the solar system. <clears throat> Other examples. <clears throat> of models. Brand name. Right companies go to a lot of trouble to get you remembering their name. What do they want you to associate their name with. Their products, and in particular, what about their products? Quality. quality, right? So they hope it's a model of, in your mind, a model of quality. And, <clears throat> and what they don't want is for it to become a model of disquality. Back before your time, so I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, um, Firestone's known for what? Tires. Well. Ford Explorer, which was, a, a, I guess, one of the early SUV, well, what do they call them? Is that right? SUV, one of these things that's high-centered, uh, was sold with Firestone tires on. And there was a slightly higher blowout rate on these Firestone tires than was the norm in the industry. And it turned out that if you blew a tire <coughs> in an Explorer, you did not want to be in that vehicle because the death rate was enormous when that happened. The vehicle, because of the high center, would tend to roll and people were being killed in it. Very, so there weren't that many deaths overall, but, but if the tire blew out, suddenly your chance of dying went way up. And of course, Firestone was in the news for all that negative publicity and that was not a good thing. So their, their na brand name became a model of something else. Um, <clears throat> You're used to model pictures as being models of things. Here is uh, what used to be the back of the Austin phone book. It was some law firm being advertised. And I was looked at this and, and you know, I didn't know what to think about this. Maybe those are some clients or whatever. But the way this guy has this shit eating grin on his face, I figured that, <coughs> you know, maybe he was one of the lawyers, etc. Anyway, <coughs> but, it, you know, the picture really stands out, right? She's just really stands out with the blonde hair, the, the smile, the red sweater. And then I'm up in the Pacific Northwest one day, I'm probably sitting in a restaurant, whatever, bored and, and flipping through things. And in this brochure for real estate, <clears throat> <laughs> she shows up again. But I don't know why this focus is so bad. <clears throat> But now, she's in the same position. Daughter is the same. Son is, <clears throat> well, different up here. But then you look at the arms the same, the pattern on the shirt's the same. You know, everything's the same except the color, but the head's different. And, that, and hubby's different, right? So here. <clears throat> Smile, tie, they're advertising lawyer services. Here it's, you know, a nice friendly neighborhood. So hubby's dressed kind of like Bill Gates with a sweater draped around his shoulders, etc. Looks looks very different. So, you know, you see this and immediately realize there's some company out there that's marked, well, potentially, someone got 
you know, they're either marketing different family photos where you can cut and paste, or someone up here decided to Photoshop this one. Um, but <clears throat> more realistically, someone's out there playing games, creating, quote, the ideal family picture according to your audience. So we're used to pictures as bottles of things. <clears throat> Titles, models of what? Contents, right? So you decide, do I want to read this article? You read the title. That's your start. You may not be sure that you want to read the article uh, after looking at the title, but you m often have a good idea. <clears throat> we use the past as a model of the future especially when it comes to individuals or weather, things like that. Reaction of others is a model of our reaction, hence we read reviews. So, I'm going to list five points about models. So, show and tell is not quite over, but um, I now want to start talking about properties of models that we are going to use over and over. <clears throat> and this is the big one. All models are false. Which only means they have limitations, they are not perfect. So, for the most part, there is no such thing as a perfect copy or model. We use them when we think these limitations don't matter. Now, we might not always know in advance that the limitations matter. So we'll start using something, and, but that's what science is about, right? That's what the progress is about. We use something as a model and discover, oh, well, maybe that limitation isn't so good after all, and we move on. <clears throat> For now, a model does not need to be accurate to be considered a model or even a useful model. And I'll come back to that in a, several minutes. We say that a model fails, i.e. we reject it, if the limitations are serious. So I want you to do a couple things in your notes now. And then I'll also put up a poll everywhere thing that you can text in. Write down three to six ways that the scale model I just showed you of the sun 
and earth does not reflect reality. So put these in your notes, because if you're going to come to me saying, I'm having trouble, I want to look at things like this in your notes. And, <clears throat> and then I will also let you text in So, so you can text things in. How is a scale model, this scale model of the solar system? Not exact. Don't worry about the goal. Choose any goal you want. But what wasn't real about that? And this ought, I mean, you ought to be able to come up with easily a dozen things, depending on how specific you are. But this is just, it's obvious, right? So just get in the habit of looking at something and say, well, yeah, that may have been useful for this purpose, but here are several ways in which this is not exact, it's not, you know, differs from reality, etc. <clears throat> so <coughs> there's one, right? You ought to be able to just, List these ad nauseum. Because what I want you to do, right, the whole point of focusing on models is to get you to start realizing everything we do in society and science is built on models. Every model we use has limitations, and you've got to start thinking about what the limitations are to realize why the conclusions we've drawn based on that model may not hold. That's what this part of the course is about. So composition, um, other planets. Yep. <coughs> so you could do this all afternoon, right? And it's just keep listing them. Yeah. And of course, you know, composition. Okay, we'll let that go. Now I want to do a second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not very hot either. Consider a separate problem. For the goal of doing medical research, how am I not an exact model of you? Because this is the type of question where we start getting at the nitty-gritty of things. And I suspect that most of you can come up with a one or two way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing at that. That's the first thought that occurs to me. Uh, <clears throat> so two right on the money. Wow, oh, bullshit on the way one. <laughs> That probably is absolutely irrelevant to medical research. <laughs> okay, I said I won't treat you like you're in high school, but you have to act like you're not in high school. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably, <laughs> I will quote Rick Moran. I will quote Rick, Rick Moranis in the movie Spaceballs. I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I guess I want to come back to this. <clears throat> Um, so I also, oh, I, 
So put in your notes some of those anyway. Down. <laughs> I'm not. So this actually has medical relevance, right? Because <clears throat> one, you guys are targeted by companies in Austin that do medical testing. And there, I don't know how many there are, there are several. Um, and they want you, they want people in your age group because there's a lot less crap going on that's wrong with you than there is with me. Which means when they try out new drugs, there are going to be fewer side effects that show up. Okay? <clears throat> and the NIH, and that for decades, <clears throat> NIH, National Institutes of Health, was sponsoring trials to study things like heart disease. This is actually a separate point, but it's related. And they used people like me, Caucasian middle-aged males, figuring that the differences between Caucasian middle-aged males and females and other races was inconsequential, and they found out otherwise. Suddenly it's like, oh, Women respond to, you know, environmental factors differently than men when it comes to heart disease. Different races respond differently and so on. So the model in which all the early studies were based was flawed when we tried to apply it to other groups. <clears throat> and it just happens, right? At the time, we didn't know enough about heart disease to realize that would be the case. But now, they're very careful to, when they do clinical trials, when they support clinical trials, to make sure there's a balance of participants so we don't run into that problem again. <clears throat> Back to non-biology. Slogans as models. What are slogans, what do they do? Why would people, you know, why do we use slogans? <clears throat> Yeah, so it's their trigger thoughts in your mind are sort of catchy things uh, that build associations. They're very culture specific, right? So there are some <clears throat> things, you look at advertisers on uh, television, Texas is a really good example, right? I came to Lubbock out of Wisconsin in the 60s. Who's the one who made that comment about how many drugs I tried? <clears throat> and. I couldn't believe the identity people had with Texas. It was very infectious, right? To the point that, you know, I remember driving, if I left the state, I thought, oh, I've just crossed the, the state line, whatever, and then I come back and I'm honking because I'm back in Texas again and that. And, and people, I don't know if you still feel that way, but it was a very common feeling and there's a sense of, you know, a native Texan. I'm not a native Texan and I have, you know, the wife of one of my friends would, say to me, you know, I don't care what you do, etc. you can die, I'm going to spread the ashes, you know, your ashes over the state, but you're never going to be a native Texan. I mean, that's kind of the, the sort of mentality here. And the advertisers pick up on it, right? And, and people use slogans, don't mess with Texas, right? Can you imagine a slogan like, don't mess with Illinois? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and watch television commercials, and which well, I don't want to encourage you to watch television at all, but if you're watching, you know, pay attention to them for how they exploit this, right? And how many times have you seen a commercial that says, Texas, this truck is for you? That isn't going to work in other parts of the country because they don't have that identity. So slogans for Texas are very Texas-specific and probably would really get a bad reaction in Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> so, but, so, you know, so, some, so companies want to use slogans to sort of help sell their product and get people thinking about, you know, asso good associations, etc. cetera. Um, and when they're successful, they sometimes try and move them to a different culture and it doesn't always work. So years ago, there was this email that came around with some examples of slogans that um, didn't work well and I can share those with you now. And I'm going to cover things up so we kind of expose the answers as we go along. <clears throat> so, um, 
So there used to be a car called a Chevy Nova, and you know, it was a relic, it was one of the early small cars. They decided to market it in Central America without changing the car's name. And of course, if you know the least bit of Spanish, you know that <laughs> Nova means it doesn't go. Um, <coughs> so that probably wasn't a big success. This was a good one. So do they still have Got Milk campaigns around? Used to see these billboards of you know celebrities with a white mustache and that. Well, they tried that in in uh, Spanish in Mexico, and it turned into um, Are you lactating? Which is a, a different form of Got Milk. Uh, <coughs> Coors slogan: Turn it loose in Spanish meant suffer from diarrhea. <laughs> Um, this is one thing you'll learn if you travel in Europe and you, or Australia where there's um, English speaking, there are some terms, phrases that have different meaning, right? For the most part, everything's the same, but you'll run into one or two of these, and one of them is stuff, which here, you know, I mean, uh, stuff at, you know, there'll be some company, there's some, I'm in Moscow, Idaho a lot, and there's some company that'll be, you know, uh, stuff it or whatever. Well, that means. Um, in England and in Europe, so you don't want to use that. Root also means the same thing, and so they're really amused if they're watching a sporting event here, and the announcer in, in the U.S. says, oh, the cheerleaders are all rooting for the team, right? So, um, <laughs> so there are words like that uh, that, that you've got to be careful of, but this is a case in which a, a European, so Scandinavian manufacturer of vacuums used this um, Slogan, nothing sucks like an Electrolux, which <coughs> you can appreciate wasn't a big sell in this country. <laughs> Mystic you know, was a curling iron in German, uh, wasn't a good idea because mist is slang for manure, which is probably not what you want to be putting in your hair. This one I think is really interesting. Gerber selling baby food in Africa. They use the same packaging in the US. Which, you know, and if you look at these little jars of baby food, there's a picture of a smiling baby on it, whatever. So in Africa, because there's so many people illiterate, what the, man, the sellers do is they put a picture on the jar of what's inside. So now they're selling a jar where people are associating the picture with what's inside, and there's a picture of a baby on the jar. <laughs> Colgate, this was a mistake, be hard to know, but introduced a toothpaste in France called Q, which turned out to be the name of a porno magazine, which <coughs> raises all kinds of possibilities. Um, <clears throat> this one isn't too funny. Some t-shirt maker in Miami, in anticipation of the Pope's visit, tried to make a, a t-shirt that said, I saw the Pope, and it turned into, I saw the potato. Pepsi's come alive with the Pepsi generation, translated in Chinese as Pepsi brings your ancestors <laughs> back from the grave. <clears throat> There's another one like Coca-Cola. That didn't work, work out too well. Frank Purdue's chicken slogan, it takes a strong man to make a tender chicken, translated in Spanish as takes an aroused man to make a chicken affectionate, which... <clears throat> We don't need to go there. <laughs> American Airlines advertised its new leather first class seats in Mexican market, and it translated fly in leather to fly naked. Uh, and then there's another one in Spanish that Parker Penn, you know, supposed to have read, it won't leak in your pocket and embarrass you, it won't leak in your pocket and make you pregnant. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> And then another example of, uh, which actually is quite germane to you, has to do with your, a CV or a resume <clears throat> as a model of you, right? So this is, a, this is a resume of someone who lived in the 1800s. Remus Reed was a famous cowboy in the Montana Territory. His business empire grew to include acquisition of valuable equestrian assets in intimate dealings with the Montana Railroad. Beginning in 1885, he devoted several years of his life to government service, finally taking leave to resume his dealings with the railroad. In 1887, he was a key player in a vital investigation run by the renowned Pinkerton de Detective Agency. 
In 1889, Remus passed away during an important civic function held in his honor when the platform on which he was standing collapsed. <coughs> That's one resume for him. And it was created, by the way, by some political spin doctors who work for uh, Harry Reid. Here's what they worked with. Remus Reed, horse thief, sent to Montana Territorial Prison 1885, escaped 87, robbed the Montana Flyer six times, caught by Pinkerton detectives, convicted and hanged in 1889. Platform on which he was standing collapsed. <clears throat> so, remember this, you can take <laughs> anyone's record and turn it into something that sounds pretty good. <clears throat> So we got to slogans as models. Um, and you can do as a resume. So I'm going to make four more points about models. We recognize different ways a model can be useful. And I'm going to fly through this at this point because I'm running out of time. We're going to use the acronym ACU. A stands for accuracy, C for convenience. And U for uniformity. <clears throat> so accuracy is what you think, similarity to what it represents. <clears throat> Convenience is how easy it is to use, <clears throat> cost. The time involved will include ethics in this. And I will be illustrating these next time. Uniformity kind of how similar the model is from one copy to the next. I'm introducing the concept to you. We will go over this <clears throat> in our specific examples. <clears throat> three, I'm going to recognize three types of models. There's nothing magic about this except that's what we want you to use on the homework. I'll write them down and explain them. So abstract, physical, and sampling. <clears throat> so abstract models are kind of what you'd guess at. They're ideas, they're math, computer software programs. Numbers, graphs. <clears throat> Physical models are touchable. They can be organisms, demos, structures. <clears throat> so, like you'd expect, if you can reach out and touch it, you can think of it as a, sam as a physical model. And then sampling is just how subjects are chosen for a study. Did I say demos? Demos, somewhere, yeah. <clears throat> The next two are pretty short. 
There's a concept of one to many and many to one. <clears throat> this simply means there's no such thing as only one model of what we're trying to represent. Let's say only one model. There are always lots. Also, any one object, idea, etc., can be a model of many different things. And then the last one is the shortest pieces and parts as models. A model of something can be a very small part of it. So next time I'm going to start illustrating these by going into specific examples. <clears throat>